When and where and under what circumstances did the first human being reach the terrible decision that it was okay to reduce other human beings to slavery? We've no idea, but slavery was definitely being practiced in the third and second millennia BC by the Mesopotamians, by the Egyptians, and later by the early Hebrews. It certainly wasn't the Greeks who invented slavery, though the Greeks get a particularly bad rap, because to their cost, being a highly articulate and literate people, they just happen to have provided us with a full record of how slavery functioned in their world. As we've already seen, slavery existed in Greece in the Mycenaean period from around 1600 BC. By the end of the 8th century BC, at the very latest, slavery was so much a part of everyday life that even if you had been poor, you'd have owned a slave. We know that for a fact because the poet Hesiod, author of an epic poem called The Works and Days, a kind of farmer's almanac, takes it for granted that even a peasant farmer will own a slave. Already by the 8th century too, slavery rather than wage labour was the most common form of dependent labour in the Greek world. As the historian Paul Cartledge has noted, however, slavery in antiquity covered a multitude of sins and life chances. The ideal type of the slave is the socially dead chattel ripped forcibly from organic ties of kin and community, uh, transported to an alien environment, there to be treated as merely a piece of property or as a factor of production to be used and abused at will. An inanimate tool or beast of burden with no sense of self other than that allowed by the slave owner and no legal, let alone civic, personality whatsoever. But no slave fitted this ideal type, and this is really an essential point to note. Slavery had, in fact, many faces, many conditions, and many statuses. It wasn't the case that you were either free or a slave. On the contrary, there was what one scholar has aptly called a continuum of unfreedom. And as we shall see, uh, some slaves actually did okay by the standards of the day. So today, you're going to be a Greek slave. And not surprisingly, you won't find the time or the means to leave us an account of your life. We don't have a single testimony from any period written by a Greek slave telling us what she or he felt about being a slave. A slaves make a few brief appearances in literature and very occasionally too in art. Philosophers sometimes discuss uh, slavery in an abstract way, but never with any insight into the feelings of slaves. So what we have to go on is admittedly minimal. Even so, we can build up a pretty clear picture of the daily life of slaves, even though we can't get into their heads. What we can do, however, is get inside the heads of Greeks who own slaves, which is what I want to invite you to do now. From childhood upwards, you've grown up with slaves. All your friends own slaves. There isn't a single person in the entire Greek world, so far as we know, who advocated the abolition of slavery, and you certainly don't. It would never cross your mind to do so. That makes Greek slavery a very different kind of phenomenon from slavery in the antebellum South. Even if you're a really nice Greek man or woman, which of course you are, it would never ever have occurred to you to question the necessity, the inevitability, or the essential rightness of slavery. The best we could expect of you is that you'll act decently and humanely towards your own slaves. It's true that the 5th century BC comic dramatist Crates 
does, in one of his plays, fancifully imagine a world so technologically advanced that all you have to do is pronounce a command and it happens automatically. A table, lay yourself, a mixing bowl, pour the wine, meat dish, serve the beef, says one of his characters. Uh, but that hardly amounted to empathizing with a slave, and it certainly wasn't an argument for abolishing slavery. Crates was merely envisaging a world that could dispense with slaves, and that's something entirely different. Even if you had the greatest brain in the world, you still wouldn't be able to think yourself outside the box. A common, if not universal, failing of human beings throughout history, as we've seen already. In the politics, Aristotle differentiated between what he called slaves by nature, uh, i.e. those born in captivity, and slaves by law, i.e. those captured in war or acquired through piracy and sold into slavery. Well, you didn't have to be a genius to realize that those who were born free but ended up slaves did so as the result of happenstance, whereas those who were born into slavery from the start belonged to a substratum of the human race. Oh, the proof for this, let's consult Aristotle. Just look at their bodies, Aristotle said. The fact that they're often misshapen proves conclusively they were indeed born to be slaves. Well, Aristotle, great mind that he was, was of course confusing cause with effect. Of course their bodies are going to become misshapen if you give them back-breaking work to do. Slaves also lack the faculty of deliberation, Aristotle averred. Of course they do, you prize chump. They don't have any leisure. And what on earth would they deliberate about anyway? Aristotle was a great one for defining things. And the choice phrase he came up with to define a household slave was ktema empsukon, a piece of property that breathes, meaning that a slave is in the same category as a chair or a table, with the exception that it, the slave, happens to be endowed with life. Well, I'm being hard on Aristotle because he happens to have articulated his thoughts about slavery, but he was no different from any other Greek. It's that mindset thing at work again. And if someone as smart as Aristotle was stuck inside his head, it's safe to assume that every other Greek would have been as well. Before I talk about your life as a slave, I want to give you some idea of the size of the slave population in Greece. Nobody, of course, kept a register of slaves, not even the Athenians who, as ever, provide us with the best evidence. But Paul Cartledge, whom I quoted a moment ago, drawing on comparative data from modern slave societies, including Brazil, the Caribbean, and the antebellum South, estimates, I quote, that between 450 and 320 BC, there were about 80,000 to 100,000 slaves out of a total population of perhaps a quarter of a million. Uh, that's to say, uh, somewhere between one in four and one in three of the Athenian population were slaves. Moses Finlay, who pioneered the study of Greek slavery back in the late 1950s, uh, Greek historians before his time had been rather embarrassed for the Greeks and so avoided the subject, uh, went so far as to say, we can take it as a rule that any free man who could possibly afford one owned a slave attendant who accompanied him when he walked abroad in the town or when he traveled, and also a slave woman for his household chores. So owning a slave was very much like owning a car in our society. If you were well-to-do, however, you probably owned two or three, whereas if you were seriously rich, you owned between 10 and 20. As I've already indicated, as a slave, you don't have any social, legal, or political persona. Uh, 
Uh, what that means is that you have no family, uh, no rights under the law, no political identity. Uh, you can be beaten at your owner's will and you can be forced into a non-consensual sexual relationship. If you're called to give testimony in a lawsuit, uh, you can only do so under torture, which was intended to get you to spill the beans by either confessing to your own guilt or by incriminating someone else. Uh, to us, torture in such circumstances seems not only inhumane, but also counterproductive. In the eyes of the Greeks, however, a slave was incapable of distinguishing truth from falsehood, and worse, perfectly prepared to lie just for the hell of it. Uh, remember, as Aristotle said, you lack the faculty of deliberation. So unless he was tortured, the court wouldn't know whether he was telling the truth or not. What the Greeks didn't realize is that people will say anything under torture merely to get the torture to end. In sum, you were largely invisible, both literally as well as metaphorically, because you lack what we would call personhood. As I've already indicated, however, Greek slavery was not an absolute condition and we should not treat Greek slaves as an undifferentiated mass. Uh, moreover, the bleakness of the picture I've just drawn needs to be somewhat qualified and ameliorated. Uh, given the prevalence of hardship, poverty and disease in the ancient world, uh, Greece included, you might actually prefer being a slave to being a freeman. When Odysseus encounters Achilles in the underworld in Book 11 of the Odyssey, the latter says that he would rather be a man who works for someone else rather than lord of all the dead. Significantly, he doesn't say he'd rather be a slave, presumably because being a slave would be preferable to being a hired hand, and not least in terms of job security, that, that we should also bear in mind the possibility that an aristocrat like Achilles was incapable of imagining coming to back to earth in the guise of a slave. It's clear, even so, from the statement, one, that the Greeks considered it to be a total disgrace for a free man to work for another, and two, that slavery provided some measure of economic security in a dangerous and unpredictable world. So, let's now look at the various types of jobs that you might be required to perform as a slave. Let's suppose to start with that you're a domestic, a ktema em sukon, a piece of property that breathes, as Aristotle put it. In other words, you're an example of the most advanced labor-saving device that the Greek world ever produced. You may be a cook, a gardener, a porter, a cleaner, a washer, a reader, a scribe, a nurse, both of children and of the sick, an escort, a messenger, a traveling companion, a fetcher and carrier, or pretty much all of the above rolled into one. Your quality of life depends very much on the luck of the draw. With good luck, your master or your mistress will be humane and treat you within strict limits, of course, like one of the family. Uh, he or she wouldn't want you to get uppity, however, and irrespective of how they actually treated you, um, you would, to some extent, have been officially integrated into the oikos or oikia, the, the household and family. It's Oikos and oikia that give us our word economy, which literally means the proper running of a household. The fact that you were officially integrated into the oikos is demonstrated by your participation immediately after you had been acquired in a religious ceremony by which you officially became an oikites, which means a person of the oikos. And the ceremony you went through was very similar to the one performed on behalf of a newborn baby when it was incorporated into the family at the Amphidromia, which I talked about in the previous lecture. Over time, too, 
uh, you may develop a close tie with your master or mistress. And that's particularly likely if you have to look after the children, either as a female nurse or as a male paedagogos. A paedagogos means literally someone who accompanies a child, though in practice such a slave often functioned as a tutor. And that's how we get the words pedagogue and pedagogy. Odysseus and Eurycleia, for instance, enjoy a very close relationship with one another in the Odyssey. As we saw in the previous lecture, it's she who notices the scar on Odysseus's thigh when he returns to Ithaca disguised as a beggar because she's intimate with his personal history. Incidentally, Eurycleia belongs to the Aristotelian category of slave by law. She was originally freeborn and captured by pirates and sold into slavery, and that's no doubt why she is so trusted. As we've seen already, the Greeks had an issue with the trustworthiness of their slaves. The Odyssey makes a point of differentiating the slaves who have been loyal to Odysseus throughout the 20 years of his absence and those who have not. In the plays of the 5th century BC tragedian Euripides, the, the faithful old family retainer who closely identifies with the fortunes and misfortunes of his master is a stock figure, just as he is in the plays of Shakespeare. Kent in King Lear is an obvious example of the faithful retainer who watches over his master even when he is down on his luck. Though an idealized image, it's likely to reflect reality, even though that reality may contain a measure of wish fulfillment on the part of some Greeks. No doubt if you'd been a fly on the wall in the Greek household, you'd have heard a great deal of complaints about slaves failing in their duties in various ways. Even so, there was a good chance too that you would have won the hearts of your master or mistress, particularly, as I said, if you had taken a hand in raising them. This is suggested by depictions of slaves on classical Greek funerary monuments, further indicating that they were part of the family. The slaves were also buried in family plots. All that said, the fact remains that your owner was at liberty to abuse you physically and sexually. He was also free to chuck you out on the street once you had outlived your years of usefulness, though we never actually hear of this happening. Even so, you would have been at particular risk at times of economic hardship and famine because if food was in short supply, you'd obviously be the first to be put on reduced rations or to go without. Other than at times of crisis, however, uh, domestic slaves were, for the most part, relatively well off and secure. Not so uh, agricultural workers. Uh, the size of this workforce is much disputed. Uh, sticking with Athens, uh, the size depends on how many Athenians were peasant proprietors and how many were large landowners. As a peasant farmer, despite what Hesiod suggests, you probably preferred to hire laborers on a seasonal basis than to own slaves to do the work because seasonal labor would have been considerably cheaper overall. So let's suppose that you're a slave who works for a wealthy landowner. You'll be a lot worse off than a domestic, that's for sure. That's because you'll have little contact with your owner and you won't be able to build up a personal relationship. You won't have the status, the comfort, or the security of an oikistes. Um, you'll probably sleep in a shack or a barn. If you fall sick, there may well come a time when it's not worthwhile keeping you alive. We don't know this for a fact, but you may well be restrained at night, say in leg irons like agricultural slaves who worked for the Romans. Apart from 
domestics and agricultural workers, there was also a few slaves who were described as those living separately, horis oikuntes, those in other words who lived on their own and who served their owners as managers of shops and factories, bankers, captains of trading ships, bailiffs, artisans, you name it. You got to take on these tasks because, as I mentioned, Greeks despised working for other people. So as a slave, in this category, you would have enjoyed considerable freedom. You operated independently, worked on your owner's behalf, and generally paid him or her a commission. Uh, you'd probably be much more valuable than the average slave. The Athenian general Nicias, who led the ill-fated Sicilian expedition in 415 BC, is said to have paid one whole talent, that's a huge sum of money, to purchase a particular slave to manage his silver mines. It's clear too that a few slaves who lived separately were freed after a period of time, but only a few of them. Unlike Rome, the Greeks never instituted a system whereby slaves, after performing several years of service, became eligible for their freedom. You might also be one of the demosioi, literally the public ones, that is, slaves who were owned by the state. If you belong to this group, you could be a notary, a coin tester, a jury clerk, or even the public executioner. Whatever you did, it was work that no Athenian would want to perform because it was considered degrading. Or you might be one of the 300 Scythian archers whom the Athenian state owned to keep the peace at times uh, when the citizen body got a bit unruly. Or you might be a uh, road mender or a mason. As a mason, uh, you might actually work alongside citizens. We know this from the building accounts of the Erechtheum, uh, that's one of the temples on the Acropolis in Athens, which identifies three categories of workers, citizens, metics, those are resident aliens, and slaves. And whatever kind of slave you happen to be, you might also be pressed into military service in time of war. Your worst fate of all, however, was to be an industrial slave, working down in a mine or in a quarry, very like the Egyptians' slaves I mentioned before. Athens had silver mines in Lavrion in southeast Attica, and these were worked intensively. According to Thucydides, more than 20,000 slaves, many of them no doubt from the mines, escaped to a Spartan stronghold in Attica called Desalia during the Peloponnesian War. We're told that the Athenian general Nicias, uh, whom I mentioned a moment ago, owned as many as 1,000 slaves whom he leased out at the rate of one obol per slave per day to work down in the mines. If you'd worked down in the mines, you would have been worked literally to death. Work went on 24-7, uninterruptedly. From the discovery of miners' lamps containing oil, it's been estimated that your shift lasted about 10 hours. Working in the quarries wasn't much better. There were quarries on Mount Emetus and Mount Pentelicon, close to Athens, uh, from which the Athenians extracted marble for their building program. And you might end up working there. Alternatively, you might work in a factory of sorts. The largest factory of which we hear employed 120 slaves to manufacture shields. The arms trade was big business in the ancient world, as it is in the modern. I now want to turn to Sparta, the only other Greek slave-owning community that we can discuss in any detail. Athenian slaves, as we know from inscriptions uh, regarding the confiscation of property from those found guilty of religious crimes in 416 BC, 
uh, came from a wide variety of places dotted all around the Mediterranean. Only a small minority of them would have been born into slavery. As a slave owned by the Spartans, however, you would have identified yourself as ethnically homogeneous with all other Spartan slaves. That's because when the Spartans conquered your homeland, uh, they reduced you all to servile status. Your homeland was Messenia, the rich agricultural region that lies to the west of Laconia. Laconia was the name for the territory to the east occupied by the Spartans. It gives us our word laconic because the Spartans, of course, were known for their brevity. Uh, you were called helots, a word of uncertain origin that is probably connected with the Greek verb meaning to capture. You're part of the indigenous population of Messenia and you work your own land, albeit in a state of unfreedom. You have no political or legal rights and you can be executed or hunted down without trial. Now, the Spartan poet Tatias it characterized you and your fellow helots as asses worn down with great burdens. You mainly perform agricultural production for your absentee landlords, the Spartan citizen body, which is either engaged in military training or off fighting somewhere. In times of emergency, uh, you might serve as light armed troops. You're there at Thermopylae, by the way, beside the famous 300, though hardly anyone remembers that even today. After all, you're almost wholly invisible. Even so, at home you lead something resembling a family life and you enjoy an independence of sorts. At least you're not at someone's constant beck and call every minute of the day and night like most slaves. Though we hear of an organization of Spartan youths aged between 18 and 20, uh, known as the Kruptaya, which I mentioned briefly in the lecture about growing up Greek, uh, the word translates roughly as that which is secret or covert, and the objective of it was to strike terror into you by committing random acts of violence against helots so long as you keep your head down uh, you can probably stay out of trouble. In addition, you're permitted to retain everything that you produce over and above what you have to deliver to your Spartan masters, which is probably about half. Very occasionally, the Spartan assembly might even give you your freedom, especially at times when there was a dearth of Spartan citizens, something that became increasingly frequent from 450 BC onwards. Be careful, however. On one occasion, the Spartans agreed to honor those helots who had performed acts of bravery on their behalf. But when they had got them all assembled, the Spartans massacred them, uh, judging them to be too dangerous to be allowed to live. Well, that's Sparta for you. Individual Spartans were not permitted uh, to free their slaves. One last major difference between you as a helot and other Greek slaves is that you greatly outnumbered the master race. We have no means of accurately determining the size of the helot population, but some scholars estimate there were seven times as many helots as citizens. Hardly surprisingly, your masters lived in constant dread that you might revolt, and this contributed to their reluctance to engage in lengthy foreign wars. This dread was made more acute by the fact that you were ethnically homogeneous, had a collective identity, and worshipped your own gods. And all of the above made the Spartans habitually paranoid. Their fear was increased by the fact that their way of life was more dependent on slaves than any other 
Greek community of which we have knowledge because it was the Helots who did most of the farming and the Spartans did indeed have a great deal to fear. In 464 BC, the Helots staged a major revolt which it took the Spartans five long years to suppress. In no other Greek state was there even a slave uprising, nor, so far as we know, even the threat of one. When we think of Athens' great cultural accomplishments and of, of Greece generally, we should never forget the unpalatable fact that these were supported, if not based on slavery, on the other side of history. And to put this in context, Herodotus claims that no fewer than 35,000 slaves served as light armed troops at the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC, the battle that finally drove the Persians out of Greece, as well as serving, as we've seen, at the Battle of Thermopylae uh, the previous year. If that figure is even remotely accurate, and I can't think why Herodotus would inflate it, then it's no exaggeration to state that Greece's victory over the hated barbarians was made possible by the contribution of its downtrodden and degraded. Slaves are indeed the unsung. In the next lecture, we're going to examine how it came about that the Greek military and navy, with the aid of its slaves, managed to repel those hated barbarians.